In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I want to talk to you today about a short verse that we pray in the morning prayer. It's in the famous psalm that starts with, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. In this psalm we say, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. The psalm, according to its passage in the Agbeya, the Coptic Orthodox Book of Prayers, says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. I want to talk to you about weakness. Sometimes a person imagines that he's strong, when in reality the human being is very weak. The most beneficial spiritual truth, in my opinion, one that should be grounded in, in every one of us, is that we are very weak. The person whose spiritual life grows slow and steady, this person is completely convinced that he's weak. On the other hand, the person who makes the least amount of progress or no progress at all is he who thinks he's strong, who sees something inside himself that's not real. I'll talk with you a little on weakness in general and how it's genuine to our human nature and how it can be very spiritually beneficial. We'll talk about weakness from three, three dimensions, weakness of the flesh, weakness of the soul, and weakness of the spirit. Let's start with weakness of the flesh. One day, a young man, tall, with broad shoulders, came to me. I'll never forget him, and he had big muscles, and I was totally impressed. Then he sat down to talk with me, and he said, Father, I have AIDS, and I can die at any moment. To be honest with you, I felt so much pity for him. He appears strong, he comes across as powerful and handsome, except there's a virus in his body that can eliminate him just like that. And he's a great person, pious, he, he got the disease from like a wrong needle or something like that, not from anything bad. However, I took it all in and thought, wow, everyone sees you strong with muscles and lifting weights and your appearance is, is, is as if nothing has happened. You poor thing. You have a tiny virus that you can't even see with the naked eye that can demolish a mountain of a man. So first things first, our bodies are extremely weak. You all know that if you just catch a cold, it'll knock you down into your bed for some days. And you feel that he's just like some insignificant thing that can be blown away at any time. Something so small messes up his body, making him run from doctor to doctor, and evaluations and x-rays and surgeries. Ugh, what is all that? Where did all that come from? This body is, as the Holy Bible calls it, an earthen vessel or a potter's vessel. How easy it is to break. How easy it is to break. You all know some young person that's super handsome and suddenly he gets a sickness or someone famous and strong, an actor perhaps, and then at the end of his days you look at his appearance and it hurts. It hurts to look. Why all that? Because the body is weak. Indeed, the flesh is weak. After 100 years, what will, our, what will remain of our bodies? It'll be some dust that doesn't know where it is or its value, nor will anyone even look at it. That's what will remain of our bodies. This body that we are so proud of and that we pamper and feed and spoil and stand up to put clothes on it and show off, this body in the end is merely a smidgen of weak flesh that anything could make it disappear. Let's look also at our confidence in days and years. People come in the prime of their youth feeling like, they're, like they'll never get weak, that I'm not going to get sick. We all bemoan the lost days of our youth, the days of gazing into the mirror, the great days when one would carry burdens and work hard and the youth would go places and go the girls would dress up all nice, and, 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 and. Why all that? After the days come and go, turns out all of that will evaporate. One just shuffling his feet and he comes to find that any morsel of food tires him. Why? This is the nature of the body. It doesn't endure the days or the years, and one day after the other, and suddenly the body's frail and sick. This is the nature of the flesh. When we speak of the weakness of the flesh, we also speak of accidents. Our Lord has mercy and protects us all, but one time I saw a situation that pained my heart. A virtuous man goes to check on his son who, who is immigrating and he's lying in, in bed and while he's getting up from the bed 
He slips, falls on his neck, and becomes paralyzed from the neck down. This is a virtuous man, a blessing, who just fell off the bed. We're not talking about a car accident. We're not talking about a plane crash. Paralyzed, hands and feet, can't move. That's the body for you. That's the person that goes and comes and yells and rocks the world and dreams that he'll one day do this or that. That's the flesh. Indeed, it is extremely weak and fragile. The second type of weakness is weakness of the soul or the psyche. David the prophet utters a beautiful word in the psalm saying, My soul is greatly troubled. If you, David, are greatly troubled, what are we going to do? You, St. Paul, say, We were burdened beyond the measure, above strength. But you're St. Paul, whom we look up to and say he's unshakable. No, no, even St. Paul can be shaken. How about you, Elijah? Do you say, My soul is sorrowful, even unto death, or say, O Lord, take my life. You, O Lord Jesus Christ, to whom is the glory, say, My soul is sorrowful, even unto death. Our soul is very delicate. Don't listen to the guy who says he doesn't feel. No, no, there's nobody who doesn't feel. You can be laughing now and just one hour later be weeping. You may hear some news that just demolishes you. It flips your entire being and troubles you, leaving you all dazed and confused to a breaking point. That's the human being for you. He appears to have a powerful soul. He makes decisions. He rocks the world. No, no. Hold on now. Take it easy. He's just a vapor of air. How easy it is for him to be shaken and get disturbed. And sometimes you find him happy and sometimes not. Jesus' disciples were on clouds of happiness while while distributing the five loaves and feeling the miracle. And people are boasting of them and glorifying them. Then not even a few hours passed by when we find them at the peak of anxiety. They're screaming in the sea, drowning. We're not talking about a month later. That's the same night. The events were hours apart. Why? Because that's what the human being is like. That's his soul for you. It goes up, then abruptly falls down. From the weakness of man's soul is the tendency to worry and get depressed. Unfortunately, As the earthen vessels that we are, we believe and pray and trust in God and read the Holy Bible and serve and talk about God and talk about hope, and suddenly, all of that falls by the wayside. And and a bout of anxiety overcomes us, or a bout of depression, and you you can't escape from it. You find yourself dazed and confused. One time a guy came to me saying, Don't I believe in God? How can I get so scared? How could I get so disturbed? And, and what about all the serving I did and all those prayers I prayed? Did all that get canceled out? No, son, it didn't get canceled. You pray, you love God, and you trust in God, but you are weak. You forgot that you and I are weak. The human being is weak. His mentality is weak. One hour he's flying on cloud nine, feeling all of heaven is in his hands, and whatever happens, happens, and he's ready to die for the name of Christ. And the next hour, he's terrified and scared and troubled and depressed. And he says, I wish I was never born. That's the same person. Why all of this? Because he's a weak person. Plain and simple. Man is weak. His mentality is weak. Also, low self-esteem. We tend to think that people who who have low self-esteem are people who are slapped around from all aspects of life. Like, for example, some person who was handicapped or disfigured, who never saw a good day in his life, who nobody ever said anything nice to him, and we think, yeah, he's going to have a low self-esteem. That makes sense. Whereas, surprisingly, someone like King Saul has a low self-esteem. Saul, how did you get such a low self-esteem? Where did it come from? You are a king, the first king in the history of God's people. You're the disciple of Samuel the prophet. You're the one God took from being a poor farmer to a king of the greatest kingdom of your times. Nevertheless, you have a low self-esteem and become jealous of David, and you sense that that David is going to take your place as king. And a word here makes you go in one direction, and a word there makes you go in another direction. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. It drives him crazy. And David is going to kill. David is going to die, acting like a child. 
Who said David is going to kill you? Why all this? Weakness. Weak human being. He has everything, but he can't see any of it. He's unstable and in total disarray. Low self-esteem even comes upon the great saints. Moses, the great prophet, said, O Lord, what wrong did I do to deserve this load you gave me to carry? Was I born for this burden? This is a moment of low self-esteem. Then Moses wants to run away and leave all his good work behind. But Moses, you did miracles nobody ever did. You saw the sea standing up in front of you like a wall. No, in the moment of weakness, he says, how was any of this my business? He saw the Messiah with his own eye, but he gets low self-esteem. He fell to a type of anxiety, fear, and horror. The human is weak physically and weak psychologically. Don't get surprised when one of God's important servants gets worried or depressed or scared or has low self-esteem. Don't think that these things don't happen to, to priests or bishops or saints. No, no. The human being is weak. Physically weak, psychologically weak, and spiritually very weak. The first sign of spiritual weakness is the person who repeats his sins. You confess your sin, you repent, and you really repent with honesty. You truly love God, and maybe tears fall from your eyes, and you pray with zeal and heat. You feel like you're taking off from the face of the earth. And then what? Not even hours pass by, you get blindsided, do something wrong, and say, Am I the same person? How is this uplifted state? How in this uplifted state can all this happen in the same day or, or the next day? You are a weak human being. Don't ever think you're powerful. Mighty people don't exist in this world. The strong person is strong in God only, but nobody is strong in himself ever. The repetition of sin, despite all the promises, confirms that you're a weak person. Spiritual weakness becomes clear when things start to deteriorate. It turns out you're surrounded by a spiritual atmosphere, you serve others, your home is good, your parents are kind people who fear the Lord, and yet you find yourself broken and maltreated and you continue to do wrong. Can you believe that? Don't you have any excuse? All those circumstances are to make you a saint, but instead you say you got worse. What does it mean? You are weak, my beloved, a weak person. Take it easy on yourself, because ultimately, you're just a human being who's weak, like all people. Don't get awestruck when David fell in the sin of adultery, or when Father Abraham got scared one day, or when Solomon, who saw the Messiah with his own eyes, goes with useless women. Take it easy on yourself. You too are just a weak human being. St. Peter, who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain, denied Christ and swore that he didn't know him. Why? Weakness. The weakness of mankind. He's a weak human being. What can we say except that? Something else that assures us of the weakness of the Spirit is what comes out of your heart. Weird desires and wicked and devilish things that astonish yourself. And then you say, how can I get feelings of gloating? Where did that come from? I love all people. How come this feeling fills my heart? Shall I lust for something I don't have? All my life I've had much and been satisfied and God has given to me. Why is this issue consuming my mind? How could I go to angry to, to that extent and want to get revenge? After all the sermons I've heard and after all the things I've said, what are these weird desires? What are all these evil thoughts that have infiltrated me? Take it easy. You're only human. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am what? For I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. Does the, the, this, does the discovery of your weakness, of our weakness, trouble us? On the contrary, he who is convinced that he's extremely weak doesn't get troubled much. However, the person who gets troubled much is the one who thinks he's strong and then discovers one day that he's very weak. But the one who knows from the beginning that he's weak does not get disturbed much. I'll tell you several important ideas. In a state of humility, weakness is an acceptable plea or argument. What does that mean? 
when you stand in front of God and say to him, Indeed, I am a leaf, like Job said about himself one, th- one time. I am a leaf blowing in the wind. That's how he felt about himself after tribulation. David said, I am a worm, not a man. That's how he felt one time. I am dust, O Lord. I am a vapor. The moments when you feel that you're extremely weak, that you're nothing, those moments are very beneficial. And you can offer an acceptable plea. What is an acceptable plea? What does that mean? If you did wrong and stand in front of the Lord and tell Him, the circumstances forced me to do wrong, this is an unacceptable plea. If you're wrong and stand and say, they are the reason, this is an unacceptable excuse. Adam did that. If you stand in front of God and say, I didn't know, this is an unacceptable excuse. However, if you stand in front of God and say, I am weak, O Lord, this is an acceptable excuse. Do you get the point here? Don't stand in front of God and apologize for your sins with any other argument except by saying, O Lord, I am weak. What else can I say? I promised you and I failed to deliver. What else can I say? I wished to do right and I couldn't. What else can I say? I was thinking I'll pray all night. I fell asleep without praying. I don't know what to tell you except that I am what? Lord, I am a weak person. An acceptable plea. Pay attention. As much as this plea, plea bothers us, it is, an exce- it is acceptable to God. The Lord, to whom is the glory, the day he found his disciples sleeping, the night of his crucifixion, he warned them to stay awake with him and told them what? Do you remember? He said, the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Yeah, Lord, you found them an excuse? So if Peter had awoken and said to you, I'm sorry, Lord, the sleep, you know, my flesh is weak, the Lord would have told him, I know, my love. Yeah, Lord, you're so kind like that. The excuse of weakness is acceptable. Of course, don't any of you take this idea and say, hey, look, we found a loophole. Let's do what we want to and then just say, I'm weak, I'm weak. No, that's not the intention here. However, this is the, re- the, re- the reality that when someone stands in front of God as a weak and feeble human being, the Lord accepts him because God is God of the weak. God of the weak doesn't mean he gives us weakness. It means God knows well that we are weak to the point that Paul the Apostle, after his trial with disease, a disease that just demolished him and humiliated him when he said, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to befame me. Even the language he uses makes you feel there's a kind of humiliation. Paul, the, devil's bu- the devil buffets you? The devils are terrified of you. Paul says, no, no. The devil slapped me around left and right, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Then what? He said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. No. The, Lord, the Lord's response was what? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I want you weak. Stay weak. God, I don't understand. So what's the problem with that, my beloved? I can't muster the will to act. So what's the problem, my beloved? My goal has no purpose. So what's the problem, my beloved? I can't pray. So what's the problem? I have no desire to read the Bible. I know. I get depressed for no reason. Yes. I'm disgusted at everything. I have no desire to do anything. Okay. All that can be summed up in one word. Weakness. Lord, I'm weak. Done. It's on me. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then what did St. Paul say? He said, I got it. I understand. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I stand in front of him weak, completely weak, and ashamed of my failure and my weakness, then I'll gain everything. I'll be strong in him. Don't ever think that the saints were always strong. All the saints were weak, very weak, very sensitive psychologically. Physically they were weak, spiritually they were falling into difficult sins. But what distinguished them in simple terms was that they knew they were weak. So all they spoke of was God's power. The first one to say, I am weak, with complete conviction, 
it's the saint, not those who are far from God. When he says in the psalm, But I am poor and needy, make haste to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. The one who can say, Lord, I am poor, I am spiritually poor. Pay attention to this point. I am spiritually poor. I don't understand spiritual things. I don't know your will. I'm not deep like the saints. I don't know anything at all. So what's the problem? Make haste to me, O God. You are my help. Do not delay. Another passage says, for example, because I'm the only son and I'm poor. Which of you can make yourself grow taller by worrying too much? This is one manifestation of weakness. Okay, try it. Be anxious and see how much taller you get. If we can't even lose weight, how are we going to make ourselves taller? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? All who are short wish they were tall, and all those who are tall wish they hadn't gotten too tall, and all who are overweight want to lose weight, and in the end nobody can do anything. Okay, what's the problem? If this small affair is making you pitiful, are you going to transform your heart? Are you going to transform your mind? Are you going to remove all the corruption inside you and replace it with holiness? Why not just confess and say I'm weak and be done with it? Another important point. Remember your weakness in times of strength. The danger lies where? When God gives you success, He gives you achievements, He blesses you in the ministry, He blesses your raising of your children, you succeed at your job, you acquire some unexpected gain, you are praised, then you start to believe the praise. You actually believe it. What can I say about you now, now that you've believed it? Don't dare to forget your weakness in the moments of strength. Don't ever forget that you're going to get feeble and die. Don't forget you're going to again do wrong. Don't forget you made promises but didn't deliver. Don't forget that the flesh is not strong, the soul is not strong, the spirit is not strong especially when God works with you. In moments of success and accomplishment, this part is dangerous for us. Whereas if you committed yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, do with me whatever you want, even shake mountains, it is impossible for me to, get to, me, for me to forget I'm weak. Then he'll, you, you, he'll use you to, to move mountains. But God is the one who is limited because if he uses you to move mountains, You'll just explode from the dignity and from the sense of self, and you'll be unable to endure it. However, if you remain convinced that you are indeed weak, then we're done. Anything's possible. Remember your weakness in times of dignity and praise. When you're honored and complimented, don't ever forget your weaknesses and sins. Moments of dignity and praise can come to you. We're not forbidding that. But the important thing in this moment is to think well. Who are you? Do you know your strength or did you forget? Did this moment cancel out the other moments? Does the day in which people saw you as something great cancel out the days when you couldn't even tolerate yourself? It doesn't. Remember your weakness when God permits you to have dignity. Remember your weakness when you see the work of God. Like one guy after the crisis of the revolution, he came to me and said, well, would you look at that? It turns out I know how to pray. Meaning he thought that his prayers are, are what removed the government and changed the entire political landscape. I told him, no, you don't know how to pray. Definitely you understand it. Your understanding is incorrect. Here, when he prayed one time with some real emotion, he thought that his prayer flipped the nation, forgetting there were millions of people praying. No, when God intervenes, and there's no problem when someone rejoices over God answering prayers. There's no problem when you clearly see God's hand acting. That's beautiful. But don't ever forget that you're weak. And that there were so many times you didn't pray correctly. That you're all confused inside. And you're still just a leaf. And if God takes his hand of goodness away from you, the many disasters from your past will come back. You'll see them again. The failure, the inability the corruption, everything. Another point. Remember the strong points in the person who appears weak. When you come across someone who is really weak, don't ever forget that this person can become extremely strong. 
Imagine with me, my beloved children, that we are passing through one day from the days of history, and we see an old man drinking alcohol and getting drunk and completely out of it to the point that he's semi-naked. You'd look and say, this is wrong for this, this man's old age. Do you know who that person might turn out to be? Noah. Noah, the person who saved mankind. Noah, who the Lord was talking to him directly from mouth to ear. Do you think that in this moment of weakness, when he forgot himself, got happy with some grape, some grapevines that he'd planted and ate? And of course, with his really old age, his mind was full of confusion, and it was an unsightly scene for sure. Do you think this moment of weakness will cause 100 years of building the ark to be forgotten? God doesn't forget. He covered up the mistake, accepted Noah's apology, and Noah was just like he'd been before, the man of God, honorable. And all of us who are weak, if we'd seen that man in that state, we would have said, that's wrong for his age. No, be careful. You know that you yourself are weak and God accepted you, and he uses you to do his good work. Why can't God use others besides you? And if there clearly is a weak point, that doesn't cancel out the fact that there are strong points. In this moment, Noah was weak, but in, in another moment, his faith was marvelous. Paul the Apostle wrote, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark. And with it, he saved the world. Do you see that? These are the parts that will be remembered from Noah's story, which we didn't like. Let's recall someone like Jonah the prophet, for example. If someone saw Jonah the prophet while he's sleeping in the boat, God tells Jonah to wake up and pray. Then he says, I'm not going to pray. We say, what's wrong with this guy? He's not a servant. He's not even one of God's people in the first place. He's being told to pray, and he says, I'm not going to pray. Angrily and stubbornly. And Jesus himself witnessed to Jonah and said, Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites. Is this a clear point of weakness inside Jonah? Some stubbornness? Some nervousness? It is a weak point. We don't deny it. And a bad weak point at that. But it doesn't strike through the fact that this man has a strong relationship between him and God. And he can pray when it's time to pray. He saved an entire people. He had a dialogue between him and God like that of friends. When you look at the widow whom God sent Elijah to, she's a widow who's poor, pathetic, a Gentile. You look at her and you feel like she's got nothing to offer. Would you think that this woman who's so weak, who has no potential at all, she's the one who would host Elijah, the man of God, in her home for over a year? And her prayer led Elijah to raise her son from the dead. Paul the apostle attributed her son's rising from the dead to, not to Elijah. He attributed it to her faith. Paul said, women receive their death, their dead, raised to life again. She told him, did you come to my home to remind God of my sins? The boy died, see to a solution. And with marvelous simplicity and powerful faith, Elijah told her, told, told God, see to it, Lord. Don't embarrass us in front of this woman. And the boy rose up. This poor woman who nobody pays any attention to, like someone you'd see in the slums or in the villages, you feel like she doesn't understand anything, that she doesn't know anything. Who would have thought that this person who doesn't know anything can raise the dead? Who would have thought with her simple faith? Do you see people's weak points? Or are you able to remember that just as you are weak and God covers your weakness to manifest a certain appearance in front of others, likewise, their weakness is manifest, but they have power that is hidden. Like, for example, all those, all those women named Mary who went to Jesus' tomb. Who are these ins insignificant women whose minds are empty? Who are waking up before sunrise, going to Jesus' tomb? And to do what? The Bible says, to anoint Jesus' body. Don't you women have any brains? Aren't there soldiers over there? Isn't there a boulder clo closing the tomb that men, are, that men are, are not able to push out of the way? What are you doing? What is this woman's work that you're doing? Anybody evaluating this situation using just their mind wouldn't be able 
to show any respect to these women. And they were the first witnesses to Christ's resurrection. Maybe people could fault them for the naiv their naivety and hastiness. These kinds of actions don't come to the minds of just anyone. And the Lord made them the first witnesses to the resurrection. Therefore, the point of weakness you see in these people might just be a hidden power of massive proportions. Don't focus on people during their moment of weakness. We don't realize that there is something between them and God, something big. The last thing I'll say is, remember this rule. Your weakness does not obstruct God, whereas your strength does obstruct Him. Be weak and confess that you are weak. You'll find His strength is made perfect in your weakness, meaning He'll work with you and through you. He will compensate for, your, for everything you are missing. He'll perform something through you, even when you're weak and remain weak. Pay attention. It's not necessary that he remove your weakness. You could continue having poor health, and God can work through you while you're sick. You could be shaken to your soul, and God can work through you while you are uh, psychologically weak. You could still be falling in certain sins, unable to overcome them, and God can work through you and be glorified in you all while you're still in your spiritual weakness. This is God's system, just like that. Don't fear weakness, my beloved children. Fear strength. When you're weak and totally convinced all the, all the time that you're weak, and you tell God all day, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak, you can be sure that now you are an instrument of good in God's hands. And glory be to God forever. Amen.